Business over drinks. Business over drinks. This is Dave and Tom. This is business over drinks. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Business with Drinks. My name is Tung and I'm calling in from Singapore. Hey everyone, my name is Bre- yeah, my name is David. I'm oh, sorry, I'm distracted by a voice, man. Well, what's wrong with it? What's going on? <laughs> so I've got a bit of a cough, so sorry for sound like uh, I've got a literal frog in my throat, but uh, I am powering through because I think we've got a really exciting guest today and I promised Dave that I'd be on this podcast. So that's why I sound like this, but it's cool. Yeah. I sound more manly today. So, it's yeah. so anyway, welcome to Business Over Drinks. Tone does not have Omnicron, I don't think, and it's not contagious over the waves anyway. So <laughs> welcome to Over Drinks. We have a fantastic guest today. And I'll just do a quick intro about him. So uh, I was I was looking for I'm really into my morning shakes. I'll talk about it when we talk about our drinks. I was I was I heard I've been doing research on greens, and I was initially thinking of um, athletic greens, which everyone talks about, but they're just so expensive, right? And I stumbled upon um, Forest Superfoods, and they and and before I start, they're not paying us at all for this, unfortunately. But this is completely personal opinion. It's it's just um it was just a fantastic product and, and I immediately signed up. I did my research and the stuff they sold. So this is uh, Naked Greens and the the stuff they sold was just pure and and it, and clean and and good quality and affordable. So I bought it and, and I thought I've got to have this guest on. He reminds me of um, Matt Stallone from Protein Suppliers Australia, who we had on uh, last year. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you the founder of Forest Superfoods, uh, Justin Snyder. Welcome to the show. Thanks, boys. It's great to be here. Oh, yeah, I kind of mumbled through the intro. Sorry, man. <laughs> yeah, but- <laughs> Justin, <laughs> yeah, Justin, that might have been the most underwhelming intro you've ever got, so I want to apologize. Yeah, but, but um, if you guys listen on, you'll... you'll, you'll- figure out how fantastic Forest Superfoods is and the great work Justin's doing. So so uh, welcome once again to the show, Justin. Thanks, guys. Really glad to be here and yeah, looking forward to having a chat with you boys. Um, before we start, what's everyone drinking? I'll start because mine is probably the most boring. So I'm just drinking a local coffee in Singapore. It's from a chain called Fun Toast. They're also not sponsoring me as I go there every day. So that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I, uh, as I just mentioned, because it's just daytime for all of us in this podcast. I'm, I'm drinking my morning shake, so which normally has bananas, uh, broccoli, oats, honey, protein, and now it has greens, uh, naked greens from Forest Superfoods, which contains, uh, so it contains Australian wheatgrass, barley grass, chlorella, moringa, and is it moringa or moringa? Moringa, right? Moringa, moringa, yeah. Yep. And spirulina, and that's it um but we'll talk more about that later justin what about you what are you drinking i'm drinking so one of our newest products is australian grown lines made mushroom with australian grown coffee and so i'm having those as an espresso it's it's incredible the australian grown coffee is amazing it's it's really strange because it's we have such amazing produce in australia and the coffee is a great example you know we have such amazing produce coming of australia but it just doesn't seem to be that popular. And I don't know if it's because of price, you know, so when you go to the big stores to get a coffee or you go to a cafe, they're kind of very price focused. So they go with something which is a bit cheaper, but coming from overseas. But I really think that, um, especially since the pandemic, people have got a real appreciation for Australian grown products. Uh, And I think there's a real kind of movement towards Australian grown things and people can see the value in having something to Australian grown, even if it's more expensive, there's a real kind of appreciation for Australian grown things. And that's why I thought it'd be so cool to do, you know, it doesn't make sense to have Australian grown lines main mixed with um, coffee that's coming from South America or somewhere else overseas. So we, when we did our blend, we did it with Australian grown lines main and Australian grown coffee, and it's delicious. Do you think it's a way coffee is branded? Because if, if, if someone says, what's a good coffee, where does it come from? They'll just instantly say South America, right? Yeah, I don't... I think it's just what people are used to. I think most Australians wouldn't even know that there's Australian grown coffee. You know, they wouldn't even know that it, that it exists. And I think maybe, yeah, these big brands are so much better at marketing themselves. And, you know, just to get into the supermarket, you know, is a huge expense and a huge risk in order to sell your products to supermarkets. So it's generally the big brands that are bringing in produce that's made overseas that, that are then willing to put it into into supermarkets, whereas the Australian growing guys, they're probably a lot smaller and they're not doing the volumes that you could kind of use to um, 
to justify all the expense involved in getting on the shelf in the supermarkets. Yeah, no, um, I, actually, I'll be honest with you. I've never heard of Australian coffee either. So that that's quite interesting. I, um, I'll be down in Brisbane soon. So I'll just give it a try and see whether yeah. there's a, like what it's like. I'd love to try it. A lot, of, a, a lot of it's coming from that kind of northern New South Wales, southern Queensland area in the subtropics. Um, because coffee is a plant that grows really easy in that in that kind of area, in, the, in a subtropical climate, coffee grows really easy and it grows underneath other trees. So you don't need to make a specific spot for it. You could just put it. So if you already had an existing orchard with macadamias or mangoes or avocados, you can put your coffee trees underneath those other trees, thereby not needing to take up any extra space and the coffee will grow really well in that kind of position. So it's, um, yeah, it's amazing more people don't grow because they're really easy to grow. And, um, you know, what's better than having your own coffee bean? That's fascinating. That's actually a really, really interesting thing. I had no idea yeah. that was the thing. I just, for, for some reason, I just have that stereotypical <clears throat> image of, of, of farmers working in South America. You know, they could be cocaine farmers, yeah. but we don't, we don't know. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't know you could just grow it in your backyard. That's crazy. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, I've, I've kind of, I, I come from the Byron region, like out in the rainforest there. And we had uh, about 30 coffee trees just underneath um, uh, some of our native trees. And they did really good. And they only get small. They only get to about three meters tall or so. And um, yeah, fresh coffee beans are amazing. Oh, that's something that, that's something that we've got to try, Dave. Yep, uh, yep. You need to do more research, mate. I need to do more research, all right. <laughs> so I, probably, I probably want this, I really want to ask more about this, but we're probably uh, going to get strapped for time. Yeah, we, we'll go down the rabbit hole. Why, why don't I kick <laughs> things off? Because uh, Justin, uh, since I'm based in Singapore, right, I don't really know that much about uh, Forest Superfood. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about the early days. Like, you know, apparently you were working from your spare bedroom when you're living in, in Melbourne. Like, how did it yeah. start? How did you, how did you find the money to actually like get this off the ground? So it, it started after I finished high school, I was lost like most people are when they finish high school and yeah. I decided to just go backpacking. So I went to India and I was backpacking across India for month. I think at the first stint was about nine months or so. The first time I've been, I've spent three years altogether in India, different trips. And, and on one of those early trips, I came across this product spirulina which is an algae that grows on top of the surface of the water. And it's really, and I was vegetarian at the time. And when I did the research on spirulina, I found it was super high in iron and protein, as, as well as a whole lot of other things, which are difficult to get when you're a vegetarian. And I was blown away by this idea that there was foods out there that could basically acted like taking isolated vitamins or supplements for nutrition, nutritional compounds but it was taken in the sort in, in the form of a food which means it has a whole different implications in terms of how your body will absorb it and in terms of um, how easy it is for the body to digest and all that kind of thing and so I found spirulina and it just kind of stuck in my head um, and then when I was about eight years later or so I was looking for a new business to start and I just thought this superfood thing is going to be huge back then there was maybe one or two sellers in Australia who were doing it but there was no, you know, you couldn't get in every supermarket and it wasn't in all the health food stores and it was a very unknown thing. But I thought there's going to be huge amounts of people who want to improve their health and improve their nutrition, improve their energy levels and libido and everything else. And to do that just by adding extra foods to your diet, to me, seemed like a no brainer because you don't get the side effects that you get with having pharmaceuticals, you don't get the um, body rejection of the nutrients that you can get when you have um, isolated compounds or vitamins. And so I just thought this is going to be no brainer. I was living in a townhouse in Northcote at the, at the time and I had no money. And so I just thought, um, I, I just thought, well, I'll just start slow. So I put the products online and I would just go down to like the local health food store and I'd buy, you know, two kilos of the products that they had available. So I think by then they had, you know, maybe gojis and macro available. Mm -hmm. So I'd buy two kilos and then I would sell, I would divide that two kilos into 250 gram packs and then, and then send that out to the customers. And then we'd get enough to be able to order direct from um, distributors. And eventually we got enough, you were getting enough volume to be able to order direct from the suppliers themselves. And then once we we're able to order from the suppliers, we had so much more control over, you know, the quality and because the quality of the product, it's, not just about what country it comes from, but there's also other things in there, like um, the way it's dried makes a big difference to the product. You know, to the end product, 
if you get something which is um, spray dried compared to freeze dried, that's a very different finished product because when you spray dry, you're going to have a huge nutritional, you, you're going to lose some of that nutrients during the drying process. But when you freeze dry it, it's dried in a second. I think it takes one or two seconds to completely dry it. And it's a yep. very expensive process, but it locks in all the nutritional yep. compounds so mm -hmm. that the finished product that you receive as a powder is very similar to having it fresh. And so I just kind of start off slow like that. And as we, as I was, starting it's it, it just it was just luck but six months in it started to become this huge thing and it be, started to be something the supermarket started selling so the supermarket started selling superfoods as well and so that gave kind of and the pharmacies and that kind of thing and that gave real kind of legitimacy to the industry and people thought and people started to see it as like a, a real thing and then, i don't know if you remember back in those days there was also this talk about hype and about superfoods being you know, buzzwords and trends. And I kind of knew it was going to be this long-term thing. And and by having it available, you know, and having maybe having lower quality products, but similar products available in pharmacies and um, health food stores and supermarkets and everywhere else kind of brought legitimacy to the industry. So it then helped to really um, build the demand for those products. Whereas the first business I started when I was 17, it's called Happy Cow and I still own it now, but it's doing leather bags and it's like leather hip bags, like stuff you wear to festivals and like mm -hmm. out to clubs and like when you're walking the dog and that kind of thing. And there was never really a lot of demand for those products because there wasn't an industry that existed. Like people came across them and went, that's cool. I want to buy that. And they'd buy it but there wasn't the existing demand there. And so I was always trying to create demand for the products. Whereas I thought these superfoods, the demand is going to be there already. And all I need to do is just make sure that I, I target, you know, that I'm very clear with the demographic that I'm targeting for those products in order to, to carve out a piece of the market. Was, was this and all so was online very, sales, sorry, or was it through the yeah, oh, yeah, supermarket? For the, for the bags, you mean? Uh, sorry, oh, for, for, the, for the bags or for forest superfoods? For forest superfoods. Or the so when days. it started, it was for, no, it was just direct. It was just direct um, online, and we've done a little bit of kind of sales to Costco and stuff in Spain, and we've sold to a few supermarkets in um, China and Japan and that thing. But we haven't done the supermarkets in Australia, and I'm not sure that it's the right demographic for us because I think when people generally buy things from the supermarket, it's very much just like what's the cheapest price, and and we don't, our, when when I'm looking at what products to sell and what supplies to work with, I try to ignore the price and just look for the best quality product. And I know that goes against a lot of um, a, a lot of the general consensus in business. And it took me a long time to work that out as, as well, because you'd hear people whinging all the time, you know, the price is too expensive or you could get a supermarket for X amount or whatever, but you actually, the people you carve, I've been able to carve out a chunk of the market for people who appreciate having the highest quality products and they're willing to pay a little bit extra to have the best quality. And, and, and so by going down that different route to the route that everyone else goes down when it's just price focused, I think means that we've been able to be very successful when a lot of other businesses in the same area haven't grown or, you know, have, have gone out of business because once you start competing on price, there's always going to be someone who can, who for can eat for, eat for cheaper than you. Yeah, that's what my, my grandfather used to always say to me. He was an amazing businessman who came to Australia in the 20s with nothing in his pockets, like escaped well, escaped the Nazi, Nazi Germany, came to Australia, nothing in his pockets, and built up this massive business. And, you know, and, he, and I learned a lot from him. And he was always saying, you know, you can't compete on price. There has to be something else that you offer to people mm. which makes them come to you that isn't price based because someone else yeah. is always going to eat for cheaper than you and it just ends up being a losing battle if you could because yeah. you know if you're competing with someone else and they drop their price you then have to drop your price and they drop their price and all of a sudden no one's making any money and it's not sustainable yeah. and so that was one of his big things was like never compete on price and so i've really taken that to height with forest superfoods and we're we're definitely not you know the cheapest in the market but it's not about if people want, you know, like that that green that green blends you've got, you know, you could find green blends online that have stevia added to them, that have cheap products, you know, that have a lot of products that are coming from the cheaper suppliers, generally from China. There'll be lots of people, lots of products that have um, fillers in them in order to, you know, like protein, like whey and that kind of thing in order mm -hmm. to bulk it up. 
but and those those products are there for people that want that. But there's also plenty of people out there who just want to have the best. What who know that that well for me it's like you're taking something to improve your health, taking a poor quality product to improve the quality of your health doesn't make any sense to me. And so we've always just been focused on having the highest quality of product. And that creates a reputation as well that I didn't, which I never really, I didn't realize that at the start, you know, I was just doing the highest quality because I felt like that's the right thing to do, but it's created this kind of reputation for Forest Superfoods where there's this trust in the market for the brand and people tell other people about the products because they receive such benefits from the product. And I guess that's what it comes down to is the higher the quality of the product you can give the customer, the better experience they're going to have, the more they're going to come back and purchase and the more they're going to tell other people. And and for them, if my next customer comes from, from you telling someone else about the product, that's way cheaper for me than getting a customer through Facebook or Google when it's going to cost me, you know, 25 or 30 or $35 to recruit that customer. So long-term, it's a way cheaper um, way to run the business and those savings you know they can be passed on to the customer through free gifts or through upgrades to express shipping or mm. you know all these kind of things and and even if it's you know i look at it like like um if it's going to cost me 25 dollars to recruit a customer i and i can get someone to reorder by giving them a 10 10 discount or by giving them a free gift or giving them something which is going to cost me 10 or 12 dollars that's still way far better for me than yeah. recruiting through Google or Facebook. Yeah. And so I'm always looking for those, those, those ways to, I think lifetime customer value is so important. And a yeah. lot of people in business don't put enough, um, enough understanding into that and just go, well, we just need to get new customers and are just trying to constantly acquire, acquire, acquire new customers. But with that process, you're, I mean, I guess you're giving all your money to Google and Facebook and they've got plenty of it already. But you, on top of that, you're competing with other people. So if this industry, the superfood, in, the health food industry keeps growing as much as it looks, as much as it has previously, and as much as it looks like it's going to keep growing, it's, it's, you know, it's becoming a billion dollar industry really quickly. And so all these new competitors are going to be competing with us for the ad space on Google and Facebook. And so the cost of recruiting is going to keep going up and up and up. And so being able to, to service the customers you have and look after the customer you have and make sure they have this incredible experience from the time they first find out about Forest Superfoods till the time they open the box and take the product to two months later when they finish the product and then they want to go back online and order more. If that, you know, my grandfather always say, you, you don't give people a reason to go somewhere else. And so you look at your business. So I, I'm constantly re-looking at the business and looking at the way we do things and going, where are we potentially giving people a reason to go somewhere else? And so from the very beginning, from 2012, we've always done express shipping on all orders. So we don't send any orders, regular shipping, everything gets sent express. It costs us, you know, extra $5 or so per order, which comes out of our, which comes out of my bottom line, but it means that people get their order really quickly. So when they go to, they get their order really quickly, which means they, they have a much better experience with the brand. Yeah. And, but it also means that people go, hey, this product hasn't been sitting in the back of a hot bat van for five days. I ordered it yesterday. It's arrived on the other side of the country today. And so people have more kind of um, more trust in the, the quality of the product. The integrity of the product hasn't been affected by being in a hot van mm -hmm. for five days. And they also go, I had this great experience for our superfoods. And so, you know, I'm going to reorder from there rather than go and look at what other brands have similar products. And I think that's made a huge difference in terms of not giving people a reason to go somewhere else. Because we've all had that experience when you order, you, you go, should I go buy it from a shop or should I just order online? And you order online and it takes three and a half weeks to come. And you're like, I should have just gone and gone it from the shop. You know, or I should yeah, have ordered yeah. from someone else or I should have paid yeah. the upgrade for Express or whatever. So we don't even give people that option. It's just every order goes out Express. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think that I think it's just a little thing that it helps to um, improve the experience for people. And again, I think too many business owners go, well, that's taking money out of our bottom line. But what's taking more money out of your bottom line is not having this fantastic experience for the customer.
Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, it's, it's, it's an investment yeah. in that customer coming back and ordering so, again. So I, I think that kind of ties back to your your point about lifetime value of a customer, right? So I, I, I strongly believe in that because people don't put enough effort into retaining and growing a customer. What they want to do right. is they want to acquire. If you have a shit experience, okay, we'll replace you with some with 10 more customers, right? Because yeah. to them, that's money. But for yes. me, it's, I'd rather have this person coming back over and over again, because I actually make more money from, I, my profit margin is higher. My, my revenue might be slightly low, but my profit margin is considerably higher. So that's a very yes. good point, man. I think, I think quite a lot of things you were sharing was, tied back to that actually because you you understand the value of a customer who stays with you for a very long time so, yeah and i think i think and i think there's lots i mean i think it's i think the reason why people focus on acquisition rather than lifetime customer value is because acquisitions are a lot easier and i think acquisitions are a lot more straightforward and you know you set up your ads in facebook you set up your ads in adwords and the sales come in and then you you know you expand that and keep spending more and more and more to get more people in but it's a never-ending cycle whereas I'm kind of looking at things now going, we're getting enough revenue every day. You know, I don't want to grow in terms of revenue. I just want to have a core group of customers who are purchasing regularly, who we look after and who love what we do and who get great benefit from our products. Because the more, and I think this is something that this is something that I really want to talk to you about you guys to get your opinion, because we have this idea of you have to keep growing and you have to have this infinite growth and you, your company's never big enough and your company's never, you know, you, you, you're never successful enough, you know? And I think from my experience, the, the more, the bigger the company goes, the more I need to be involved in it every day and the more stress there is for more me and the more mm. work that's involved and the less money I make because everything's going to be reinvested all the time. All the profits have to be reinvested to buy more stock, to fulfill more demand. Mm. And it means I get less time doing other stuff that I love. You know, I'm not interested in working 14 hours a day. For me, if I wanted to work, you know, 14 hours a day, I'd go out and get a job because then I'm getting paid per hour, you know, whereas I want to... I, I believe business should be about giving you the freedom and lifestyle you want to have. And I want to spend most of my day outside swimming in the dam with my son and growing food and doing Kung Fu and working on archery and building stuff. And, you know, I've got all these other interests in my life that I want to mm -hmm. do. And I don't want to be stuck inside an office working or putting out fires or, you know, filling in when, when a staff member's sick or all this kind of stuff. I want to be able to do two or three hours work a day and then spend the rest of the day doing whatever I want to do. And so I'm really trying to, I'm really moving away from this infinite growth concept and moving towards a sustainability concept where, you know, there's three or four employees, I work two or three hours a day and the rest of the time I get to just live and enjoy being outside and being on the farm and, and doing the things that I love. And so it's something that I'm, you know, it's, it's a very, it's weird that that's such an unusual concept, the idea of not wanting to grow your business. But I think there's a bit of a scare. There's a bit of a, a. I think I think it's a bit of a fallacy to always want more and more and more because then you're not happy. But I remember, you know, being 16 and going, if I was making 200 bucks a week, I would be loaded. Mm. You know, I wouldn't. I, I would yeah. be able to buy everything I want. And then it becomes two grand a week, and you're like, you know, and you go, oh, if I was making a bit more, you know, then I'd have everything I need. But it, we already have everything we need. You know, yeah, and if that, we could just, yeah. yeah. For anyone listening or watching, when we first said hi to Justin, he just finished farming. And that's something I really didn't expect from a business person. Like he, he spent the morning just farming. You have, did you say how many acres did you have? So we, I've got 10 acres out in the Yarra Valley, which is yeah. about an hour out of Melbourne. And we've got this big, beautiful spring fed dam where I go for a swim every day. And yeah. I grow, at the moment, I'm growing about 50% of the fruit and veggies that we eat. And we're looking to increase that to 80% this year because me and my wife, we're both obsessed with self-sufficiency. Mm. And we love this idea of like growing our own food and of like having our own eggs from our chickens and looking at and even, you know, having sheep so we can get our own meat. And we've got mm. 130 fruit trees that is providing fruit. And we've got two massive gardens where we grow our veggies. And I think... For me, there's a miracle. Mm. It's 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 a you know a tiny tiny seed can grow 200 kilos of food. You know, to me that's insane. You know, and I've been doing this eight years, and that blows my mind. And I've always and I say to people all the time, I think the best thing for your health is not forest superfoods. The best thing for your health is to grow your own whole foods. 
you know, pick them from the garden that, you know, have been grown organic with beautiful compost. It's full of worms and eat them straight away that day. And I think that's, that's the most nutritious thing you can do for your yeah. body and then have the superfoods as this, as to kind of, as a little bit extra on the top to make sure you're getting the full spectrum of vitamins and nutrients you need. But growing your own food does something for mental health and it does something for um, your physical health because you're out there working all the time and your connection with nature and your connection with the food. And um, I just think it's awesome. And I think I think everyone should do it. And now I'm, I'm really experimenting with growing superfoods as well. You know, so we've started experimenting with growing ashwagandha and moringa and maca and all these different products. So I think it'd be really, some, a lot of these products, they all come from overseas. It'd be really cool to get, a, to grow our own and then be able to offer that to people as well. So that's something that I'm always experimenting with as well. Yeah, back to how you said we we already have everything we want. I was actually just, I just finished watching this video of this guy who was saying he would rather live in his, in a small apartment today than be a king uh, over a hundred years ago because the quality of life is just so much better. Um, and then we do have we a lot of the stuff we do have so easily available to us compared to back in the day, and even back to when you were if you were a king, um, we, we have things yeah. so easy now. Just a quick ad break, everyone. You know, everyone loves books, right? And if you don't love books, you ought to be deported. So now, thanks to Audible, you can listen to an audio book absolutely free. Who doesn't like free stuff? Sometimes I don't, but typically I like free stuff. All you have to do to claim your free audio book is go to businessoverdrinks.com forward slash books for all those people that don't like free stuff now i understand why some of y'all didn't sign up for the free uh, website audit and the free pr audit that we offered but that's fair enough all right so just going back to the uh, the free book from audible so in this page we've actually compiled a bunch of some of the our favorite books and audiobooks that are kind of shaped our lives for better or worse that's why audible is my favorite thing because i can't read i'm basically illiterate um, we're also there's so nothing wrong with that. Oh, oh no, there is, but it's there's hundred percent stuff really wrong with that. There's a real lot of stuff wrong with that, <laughs> man. We'll be we'll be listing, uh, we'll be including some of the books that uh guests have recommended as well because we have some really great guests who actually read stuff that added value to their lives versus the stuff that we read, which just lets us pass time and and helps us forget about the sadness that is our lives. All right. <laughs> Dave, so you want to tell people how to do it? Are you drunk again, Tony? Si? All right, bit, so man. all you need to do to see these audiobook recommendations, and we've included some physical book recommendations in there too, is go to businessoverdrinks.com forward slash books. Um, but, but on that, though, I'd love to ask, for those who are just starting a business, though, you, do you still think you still have to work your ass off to get, that, to get to that point where you're making that money where you could make decisions? Or is it something you've strategically done from the start where you do what you want and then you, you do three hours a day but somehow make formulate a business where, where that where that works how, how did you do I, how did you do that i think i mean when i first when i was first starting there was no drag and drop website builders you know i didn't have money to hire a developer and you didn't have this idea of drag and drop so you had so i so i had to learn how to code in order to build the websites that i worked on and you know for the first eight years or so so I put a lot of work into doing that. Whereas these days, you know, with WordPress and um, Shopify and all yeah. these kind of programs, you just drag and drop. You don't, you, you don't even need to know how to code. So I think a lot of people would save time on that. But like, I put in a huge amount of work for the first ten years or so. You know, and I would, I remember being, you know, going away with mates to to Cambodia for a holiday, and I'm sitting at the bar with my laptop working while they're all partying and swimming in the water and mm. stuff. And you know, I'm, but it's and, and staying up all all night because I had this new idea for something I could do on the website that, you know, would help to boost sales. And so I put in a huge amount of work, but I never, I guess I never saw it as work because I loved it. You know, I loved that idea of just staying up all night working on the website. And I loved the idea of developing these new products. And I, and, and even being at the, being in Cambodia on this Island and, you know, working at, working at the bar, like I kind of, I've always got a big buzz out of these businesses because, especially for our foods, because I believe in what it's doing and I see the results that people get. So I put in a huge amount of work. And I think back then, because I didn't have money to spare, you have to do everything yourself. And that's why, and these, these you know, I heard this great thing the other day when someone said, running a million dollar business is a huge amount of work and you have to grind. But when you run a $5 million business or a $10 million business, it's so much easier than a $1 million business 
because you start yep. bringing people on who can do things, you know, and now we have, we have one full-time staff member who her only job is sending out orders. And we've got another full-time staff member who does customer service and does all the stock management. And we have other people that do all other, you know, other things. And we, and we outsource a lot of the non, the non, um, the, the, the non-essential components of the business. And so there's a, so as it grows, you can start outsourcing these other people, particularly things you don't like. I don't like the social media stuff. You know, I've always struggled with social media. I don't have a Facebook account myself. I don't use Instagram. I don't use TikTok. I don't, it's just not my thing. So being able to outsource that to a, a, free, a freelance company that's really closely aligned with us who then sends me things to approve before they post it and they handle the comments and they handle you know, the promotions on social media and stuff was a godsend for me because I don't want to do it, but I understand it's really important. So having those options as the business grows, I think makes a huge difference and it allows you to have the time to do the things you want to do. But I think, you know, I think too many people go, they've got a job and a family and a mortgage. They go, I've got this idea for business. I'll take out a loan and I'll, and I'll quit my job and I'll start this business. And I think that's a recipe for disaster. You know, if you've got an idea for a business, these days, with the internet, you've got the whole world as your potential customers. So if you've got an idea for a business, put it out there. Don't even build your own website. Put it on Amazon. You know, get samples made, put it on Amazon or put it on eBay or, you know, Kogan Marketplace or all these different marketplaces. And see what kind of traction you get. See what works. See what feedback you get from customers. And then build your own website after that. You know, you can start slow and that's what we did. You know, I put it, I think I put in 500 bucks to start this business and yeah, it's been a 10 year journey, but it's been every year has, you know, has been a massive improvement in terms of the way we do things and in terms of um, the money we're making and all that kind of thing every year. So it's been that constant growth, that steady growth and you don't want to grow too fast, you know, and you don't want to have to take um, take money from other people, in my opinion, you know, I think, you, I think it's, you want to maintain control as much as possible. And if you take loans or you take, you know, you give away equity for, for investments, then you're giving up some of that ownership you have over the business. And I think the people I've spoken to, and I almost did this last year, but the people I've spoken to who've given up um, ownership or equity, a lot of the time they end up losing interest in the business because it's no longer their business. You know, you've got other people to answer to. Um, and so I think start off slow, keep a hundred percent of your business, do things cheap to begin with. You can get, you know, if you've got an idea for a product, you can find people in Alibaba, get samples made, you know, assuming it's coming from somewhere overseas or get it made in Australia, wherever, but get samples made, put them online, save deliveries in four weeks and get a couple of sales, you know, and then once you've got some sales, then place an order for the product, you know, or even better make the product yourself. But you don't need to, this idea of, you know, needing 250 grand to start a business, that's old school thinking when you had to open a shop and you had yep. to do a fit out and you had yep. to sign a five-year lease and you had to get five staff <clears> members <throat> and, you, you know, and all this kind of stuff. These days with the internet, you don't have to do any of that stuff. And when I first started the Happy Cow business, when I was I don't know, 18 or 19, there was no, the internet wasn't a thing yet. So I would go around door to door, knocking at, at fashion stores and clothing stores and, and saying, hey, I've got these bags, want to sell them. And 99 times they would go, no, I'm not interested. And the other one out of 100 times, the answer would be the boss is in here, come back later. And I was just like, there's got to be a better way. You know, there's got to mm -hmm. be a better way to get your products out there without having to do the hard sell. Because I've done, before, I, before my first business took off, I was doing um, telemarketing sales. And it's so hard and it's so yeah. soul destroying and everybody, you're just yeah. annoying them and putting the hard <laughs> sell on. And it, yeah. ah, it's, you know, it puts hair on your chest for sure. But it also is just like- Not for Dave, not for Dave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he has on my chest. <laughs> it's, it, it's soul destroying, you know, cause you're like, you, you have to, you have to force these people, you know, you have to put pressure on people to buy stuff. And that's, that's what you're told to do when you go into the training and it's, it's just, I, I always thought there's got to be a way where you believe in what you're doing, you put it out there and whoever wants it, wants it. And whoever doesn't, doesn't, you know, and you don't need to put pressure on people and you don't need to twist people's arm and you don't need to, you know, do point, you know, I see even like in the health food business, you know, I see heaps of people who have like these point systems on their websites, you know, you buy two products now and you get 10 points, then you come back and you can spend those 10 points on things. I'm like, Either the people like the products or they don't, you know, why mm. does there have to be 
points in order to get encourage people to come back and get it. If someone buys, you know, if someone someone buys the lines main from us or buys a Macca or spirulina, whatever it is, they buy the product from us and it changes their life, they're coming back. You know, someone someone spends sixty dollars on a pack. Someone I was reading I was just reading reviews before on the website from someone who's bought our hemp oil. And they talk about how they've had this knee pain for 30 years and they started having empty oil every day. And within a week, they were pain free and they were back to running and they were able to laugh and play with their kids and go to work and do everything. People know, and, and it, you know, and it's a $40 bottle of hemp oil that lasts a month. And people have that kind of experience. They're coming back. You know, they should have, you don't need to give them points in order for them to come back and buy. You've just got to make sure you've got the product available. And that's always been my biggest challenge is having enough stock. You know, because mm-hmm. I'll go, okay, sales have doubled. I'll now produce triple the amount that we made before, and it still goes in two weeks, you know, and we run oh, out. Oh, poor you, Justin. That sounds stuff. like a terrible problem. <laughs> like, oh, no, we're selling out too fast. Last year, when that happened, so back in August, the Netflix stocker came out for um, Fantastic Fungi, and overnight, sales went up four or five X and we sold out of everything. And me in my infinite wisdom thought, we'll just do pre-sale for everybody and just make it really clear that it's back in stock in three weeks and and people are pre-buy it. So we had thousands and thousands of pre-purchase. And then we found out from, so we used a number of different licensed growers. And we found out from our main licensed grower that they tried a whole new method of growing the lines, mate, and it hadn't worked and they had to throw out the whole crop and there wasn't going to be anything else till, till October, mid-October at the earliest. And so we'd taken, we'd taken all these orders from people. So we had to refund all of these orders. And then, and it just created this mess. People constantly emailing all the time going, hey, when are you getting it back in stock? I need more. I've run out. I'm really desperate. It's really helping me. When's more going to be in stock? Which then created a huge amount more work for customer service. And then people aren't ordering. So people who usually order monthly aren't ordering because they want to get other products as well. They couldn't get other products at the same time. And it just created this huge amount of headache and stress and everything. And so I, from that experience, I learned not to do pre-sale anymore. You know, when we've got it in stock, that's when it's available. Otherwise, people can leave their email addresses and we'll notify them soon back in stock. So can but you tell us, the sorry, for those who don't know, can you tell us more about the documentary and how, how did it involve you and, and, and what kind of money you made from that? Yeah, so um, um, so there's this guy in the US called Paul Stamets and there's a really great Joe Rogan podcast with him. I think there's two now, but he's this guy who... When he was 18 or something, he discovered mushrooms and became really fascinated with them. And he's dedicated the last 40 years or so to studying mushrooms and understanding them and working out how to grow them on a large scale because mushrooms, you know, need a very specific um, climate and very specific humidity. And because they're a fungus, if some other fungus or bacteria gets in it can destroy the whole crop and there's you know they're they're very difficult to grow and it's very labor intensive to grow mushrooms and he came up with this method for growing uh mushrooms in a controlled environment that allowed them to be grown at a much larger scale than if you're just growing them outdoors and so this documentary that came out fantastic fungi was really about him and his life story and the experience he's had with mushrooms and um, it's amazing. And they've got these really cool time lapses of mushrooms growing. And they talk about how mushrooms are being used now to clean, to eat rubbish at, at rubbish tips and being used to suck up oil from oil spills and the, and the benefits they can have. And, you know, he talks about, he's, there's a great Ted talk with Paul Stavitz where he, his mother was diagnosed, I think with breast cancer at 92 or something, you know, she was old. And the doctor said that, there's nothing we can do, you know, good luck to you. And he started giving his mother um, turkey tail every day. And she went back, I think after this, three months, and the, the cancer was completely gone. And, the, and it has been gone ever since. And so he does a TED Talk talking about turkey tail and how it works on um, wow. on the cancer cells. And, that kind of thing. and I've even, my I've done a, I've, I've got Forest Superfoods podcast. I've only done one episode because I haven't had a chance to do more. But the one episode I did with this is with this incredible scientist, and he talks about how 
um, reishi and lion's mane. So the herpes virus is something that I think 60% of people in Australia have the herpes virus and it's with you for life because the body can't actually recognize the herpes virus within its own cells. And so it's able to survive there and the body doesn't attack it. And there's something, in, there's, there's certain compounds in the reishi and the lion's mane that actually help the body to identify the herpes virus and he's research which is still in you know it's still very much preliminary research and hasn't been peer-reviewed anything but the research that he's done so far has actually shown that the take reishi in particular can help the body identify the herpes virus and kill it within the body which is saying it's never been done before but there's all these incredible like um benefits that we're starting to learn about from mushrooms and, and you know there's uh the lion's mane was originally found to repair damaged nerves in the brain so people that had brain injury were found to have, have significant improvements when they thought the brain couldn't regenerate by taking lion's mane they were actually able to the, the bodies actually regenerate damaged nerves and i've had hundreds of customers say that they've had these damaged nerves in their arm from an old accident they had and um when they start taking lion's mane start getting really itchy and when I spoke to people who know about this kind of thing, that's, they would say, that's most likely the nerves repairing in the arm. And so there's all these amazing benefits from the mushroom. And so the documentary was all about all these different types of mushrooms and how amazing they are and how awesome Paul Stamets is because he's my hero and all these, um, you know, just talking about mushrooms. And it's really well done and really fascinating. And so I went to bed on, you know, at, at, at the end of July and woke up on the 1st of August and the sale, you know, expecting, I don't know, expecting a hundred sales and there was two and a half thousand sales or something. And I just went, what the hell is going on? Like, I just had no idea. And so, and then we started checking the emails of people like, Hey, I saw the documentary of Fantastic Fungi. I want to get these mushrooms because we've always used the Paul Stamets method of growing. We have the same mushrooms available that he has and we grow them in the same way, but they're grown in Australia rather than being grown in America. Um, and so this, and we're, and we're really the only place in Australia that has the Australian grown mushrooms. That's the whole mushroom, not an extract. And mm. also has the mycelium in it, which is a big part of the poor stomach mushrooms. They have the mycelium, which is like the roots of the mushroom rather than just the fruiting body, rather than just the part above the soil. Um, and then it's freeze dried, which I don't, as far as I know, no one else is doing that. And so there was this, there was kind of this, um, we we kind of we become established as the go-to place for the Australian grown mushrooms, and then this documentary came out, and I think he might even talk in the documentary about the issue with getting mushrooms from areas that are polluted because mushrooms are like sponges, and they will yeah. absorb because like, and that's why they can be used for cleaning up toxic um, oil spills because yeah. they absorb whatever's in the water that they're growing in or in the air around them. And so even I've been out foraging for wild mushrooms with some local guys who know a lot about that stuff. And they, you know, they stay away from mushrooms growing on the side of the road because the pollutants from the cars can actually be absorbed into the mushrooms. And so they'll always go out into forest to harvest them rather than harvesting them um, from roadside because for that reason. So that's why I would say to people, for me personally, I'd much rather consume mushrooms I know have been grown in Australia with clean water in the clean air we've got here, rather than coming from overseas when I don't know 100% what the air quality is like. I don't know 100% what the water quality is like. And if there's heavy metals or that kind of thing, the mushroom can absorb them. Um, and so that's a big reason why I think for mushrooms in particular, for all kinds of foods, but mushrooms in particular, there's a real, there's some really good reasons to pay a little bit extra and get Australian grown. Oh, that now that's really interesting, man. I, I think the Netflix documentary was a was a was a big thing. I think a big, I think a milestone in kind of the entire industry as well. It kind of like pushed a lot of people towards that. For sure. Um, I just want to take a step back for a minute because I think in one of your previous answers, you mentioned that you running a business for you was you didn't want to lose control, right? You didn't want to give away equity and you, you wanted to, you wanted to have as much control as possible. And I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but were you, were you referring to your, your crowdfunding raise that you kind of, you changed your mind at the last minute and, and canceled it? Yeah. So I thought, I thought crowdfunding would be a really good <clears throat> way to um, get more exposure for the brand and get, more investment for the brand. It seems like the kind of route that a lot of companies go down. Once they get to this kind of $10 million stage, they seem to go to that, that funding stages. And I thought, 
rather than go to um, you, uh, like equity investors and that kind of thing, I could go to crowdfunding and get investors from everyday people. And it was really exciting because we've got thousands of people that were interested and, um, you know, and we did all these cool videos for promoting it. And, um, and it was this really exciting idea. And then it was probably, and it took me, I can't tell you how many hours and how much investment it took in terms of, you know, all the legal restructuring and all the promotional material. And, you know, it was, it, it, it was literally three months of my life and a huge amount of money. And then it was two days before it was meant to launch. And I got this email from someone that said, um, I love you. I love what you guys do. And I've heard that, you know, I've heard about the crowdfunding thing. I'm, I'm on a pension and I've only got a little bit of money to invest, but I want to invest it with you guys. And I thought that's really humbling. And that's really amazing. You know, there's people out there that believe in what we do so much. They want to put what little disposable income they have into the brand. And I thought, but that's a huge responsibility, you know, and how am I going to feel once I've got this person's money and then I decide I want to take a day off or I decide I want to spend the afternoon swimming in the dam. And is there going to be that feeling of guilt there that I'm not working as hard as I can to protect their investment because I'm choosing to do something other than work in, with my time. And then on top of that, I felt like, so I've always in business been able to, I've been able to make my own decisions, you know, because I've never taken investors before. I've never taken a dollar from anybody. And so for a while there, we couldn't get the spirulina. We, it was chlorella. So we, we used to sell chlorella and we we're buying Australian growing chlorella and it was selling really well, but the supplier in Australia refused to give us his heavy metal certificate to prove that there weren't heavy metals in the product. And so I pulled the product, I pulled the product and stopped selling it. Because I didn't want to sell something like chlorella, which I know can absorb heavy metals from the water without being 100% sure that it was going to be safe. And But then if you've got investors, your, your priority has to be investment return and profits legally. We're required to do that, to, to make that the priority, to do what's in the best interest of the shareholders. And therefore, that integ being able to make a decision the integrity comes into question because now you've got a really hard decision because you can keep selling a product which has a good profit and which you're, um, you know, which is working well for you, but not be a hundred percent sure on its safety or its efficacy, but still feel like you have to keep selling it because you have to provide a return to those shareholders. And I went, you know what, maybe. And then the, th the third reason why I also decided to pull the plug was because we didn't need the money. You know, I was looking at all these other companies that were doing crowdfunding, you know, and talking about how they need to get a million dollars because they have to buy this equipment and they have to, you know, pay for this marketing overseas and they have to invest in this stock and they have to do it. And we already had the cash and didn't need any more cash. I'm trying to work out, well, if we get a million dollars, where am I going to allocate this money and where I'm going to allocate this money and try to find ways to allocate the money, which I think is a really bad way to go about it because i think then you end up wasting money it needs to be the other way around it needs to be like no we need x amount because in order to go to this next stage not you know we've got x amount how are we going to spend it because i think it's really easy when you've got cash in the bank to spend it on stuff as a business and as an individual and so um so all those reasons combined and i went there's just i, I think in life you've got to look at the signs. You know, I'm a big be believer in the signs. And when there's a, a whole lot of signs that keep coming up that tell you to go in one direction, I feel like you have to go in that direction yeah. or you're going to end up suffering the consequences. And there were just a whole lot of different signs that said to me, this invest crowdfunding or taking outside investment is not the right direction to go in. So I pulled the plug and I felt so good about doing it. Even though I'd wasted so much money and so much time, and probably let down quite a few people. I felt really good about it. And a lot of people, because there was quite a lot of sophisticated investors who were looking at putting in six figures or, you know, into the investment who I then e emailed personally and said, I'm really sorry, but I'm not going ahead. This is why. And a lot of them went, you know what? Sounds like the right decision to make. You know, when I've taken investments before, it's always taken the fun out of the business and I've, you know, I've had these kind of issues. And so, it just kind of reinforced to me that this was the right decision to make. And it wasn't an easy one because, you know, there was, we'll, we'll pr I probably said no to millions of dollars. It's, we'll never know how much would have actually come in, but it most likely would have been a couple of million dollars. And, uh, 
but that money doesn't go to me either. You know, that's my stage yeah. of the business that I'm then responsible for in order to keep growing the business further. And mm -hmm. I didn't want that pressure to have to keep growing. You know, yeah. I, I want to be able to grow. I want the business to be able to grow organically because people love what we do, not because I'm pushing and pushing and pushing and um, and compromising my integrity and you know compromising the integrity of the products and you know going down different routes that aren't necessarily the best thing for the business and for our customers, but they're the best thing for the investors. And I want to focus on the customers rather focus on the investors. And so it just made sense to, to pull the plug. Drawing back on your chlorella example, and in an article you even mentioned, you know, if I run out of spirulina and the only spirulina I can find is a questionable origins, <clears throat> I'm just not going to sell spirulina until I can find one that I'm comfortable with. You know, integrity, mm. right? You have a lot, mm. you have a strong conviction about integrity. Where did that come from? And, and why is it important to you? I think um, I think that came from my grandfather because he. So my grandfather came to Australia with nothing. He started off selling mops door to door, and eventually he got you know he got a car that he could go to more locations. He got a couple of guys working for him, and then once he once he had enough money saved up, he bought a little jewelry shop. And then by the time he died, he had three jewelry shops in Sydney Road, Coburg, which is a really cool area of like um, north north of the city in Melbourne. And I used to work in there every weekend. Every weekend, I would work in my... I think I spent more time, like, down at the bakery and at the swimming pool than working, but I would still, like, work, and I'd still get paid, and I was amazed to earn my money, and I'd sell the watches, and I'd work really closely with him. And he always said that in business, if you look after your customers, you'll always have customers. And I saw these other jewellery shops that would pop up, you know, along the street as well, and then disappear. And they were always, and I, and I think what I realized was that they, they were focused on their bottom line rather than focusing on the customers. Whereas my grandfather, you know, he knew every customer, he knew every customer by name. He knew exactly what they liked. He'd bring coffee for the people that he knew like coffee. And he'd sit wow. and, you know, and we'd sit and chat with the customers, you know, with the customers that had a bit of time to spare. And it was, it was the customers were like part of the family, you know, more yeah. than just like this, this kind of, um, this kind of uh, relationship at a distance. And I really learned from him this idea of looking after your customers. And once businesses go online, you're even more removed from the customers because you don't see them face to face. And so people go, and so it's too easy to go, that's not a customer, that's a user, you know? Well, that's like, a, they put a dollar value on that person. Yep. But they're, they're real people, they're still real people. You just can't see them. And so I took that kind of idea of like, looking after the customers to the online world. And, and took that idea of like, um, you know, looking after them and making sure you do the best you can by them as, as a way to feel good about myself of what I was doing and as a way to kind of grow the business. And so that's why I think we've been able to grow and have a lot of word of mouth growth and kind of have people who've been with us since 2013, you know, still buying now. And I think at the end of the day, integrity is everything. You know, in your personal life, you know, your integrity is everything. You know, if you if you don't have integrity and you can't, you know, and you don't you can't look yourself in the mirror, you don't feel comfortable with yourself or with the actions you take, well then you're never gonna be you're never gonna be happy, you know, you're never gonna be comfortable with your own life, you're never gonna be feel satisfied with the work you've done. And so I just think I'd rather be poor and have integrity than be rich and you know and have no integrity. And so I've just kind of always thought that that's so important. And I think over time, you know, in the beginning, for the first six years, it seemed like it was just costing us money, you know, <laughs> because we'd, but we'd end up spending a lot more on our raw materials and what other people, than what the competitors would. And we'd end up spending more money on shipping than what our competitors would. And we'd end up spending, you know, more money on, on sending out replacements when people weren't happy or, or the life, you know, we offer a lifetime guarantee. So if you buy a product from us, and it's got a three year best before date on it. And two years and nine months down the track, you don't think it's a good, you don't think the quality is there, you can send it back. You know, and, and having that kind of guarantee on the products resulted in, in, in that's, that's a way of demonstrating the integrity to customers as well. And I think a lot of, you have to stand behind the products you sell and you have to um, be, have integrity in the way you deal with people. And I believe that comes across, you know, even online, 
I think it comes across, it's more obvious in person and maybe it takes more time online. But if you have integrity in what you do and you believe in what you do and that will come through in your copywriting and that will come through in the products and that will come through in, you know, the 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 day to day individual interactions with the customers and all that kind of yep. thing. And so I've just always thought it's the most important thing, more important than the money. And and yeah, I don't know. I think it's just um it's really important. You know, oh, that's, the money that's... comes and goes. But the no, that... integrity is something that's with you forever. <clears throat> that's really interesting, Justin. And I think I think that's a really, really important lesson about business that maybe even we don't talk about enough, right? Integrity. The huge aspect of, I think, running what I would say is a sustainable, valuable business with a lot, with a really large lifetime value for customers, right? Uh, mm. I think I'm, I'm mindful of your time. And I really want to, I think, because we want to touch on quite a few other things as well, you know, the marketing of your business, if you have, because you said you outsource the digital marketing aspect of stuff. Yeah. But um, I think maybe one thing that we always do for all our, all our guests is to kind of understand where they get their inspiration from, where they get their drive from, and, and whether there are any, uh, do you, like, do you, have you read any interesting books or anything that have been, that have been really impactful? Um, yeah, there's probably hundreds of them. You know, it's, hard, <laughs> it's hard to choose the one. And I think, I think when you, when you read a book, you take on, you know, a couple of main things for each book and then you read another book and they all kind of blur into one, but there was a couple of books that I really wanted to mention. And one of them was rework, which is the guys who made 37 signals, which is like an online software company. And their whole, the whole book was about re-examining the idea of work. You know, and re-examining this idea of like, you're at your desk from nine to five, you know, or re-examining this idea. And because I was doing that for a long time, for a long time, I thought, well, I got this business, I got to sit down, I got to work from nine to five. And I'm pretty sure I spent 50% of the time just browsing the internet, you know, and then I changed from that idea of like, um, you know, sitting at the desk to what's the best, what's the, the most impactful things I can do to grow the business. And now I work. I don't know, my, my wife would say I still work 10 hours a day, but I'm pretty sure I either work like two hour, two or three hours a day on average. And I really think about what's going to be the most impactful in terms of improving the business and improving the offers, the, cus the customer offer that we have and improving our systems in place. And so Rework was this book. I think it was something like, it's about 10 years old now or something, I think, but they had five employees and they were doing a $20 million turnover. You know, and then because the, 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 they were they were talking about this idea of like, if you just keep adding employees as you grow, you're just going to keep eating into that increased profit that you're getting and that increased revenue to the point where you might end up having a hundred employees and have this fifty million dollar business, but you're actually making more money when it was just you and one another guy and you were turning over two million. You know, because you're just increasing your overheads all the time, and then you know if you've got if you've got all these overheads, and then there's a downturn for a couple of months then that's going to eat into all the profits you had from that increased um, increased sales from the business growth. So I'm always looking at like what systems can we put in place to automate things? And that's the lovely thing about online businesses. You can automate so much of the process, yeah. um, but automate things and think about what's going to be the most impactful, that whole 80, 20 rule of like, you know, what's going to have 80% of the, of the revenue is going to come from 20% of the profit and all that kind of thing. Um, to um, um, eighty percent of the revenue is going to come from twenty percent of the activities of the business, and looking at all, all the, the things you can do to systemize the pro the processes you use and automize or automate or make autonomize. it automatic yeah. autonomize yeah the way you do things in order to allow things to kind of run on their own as much as possible. Um, and so that was, I got a lot from, I got a lot out of rework, which is a really interesting book that I recommend. And there's another book you might not have heard of called the ultimate guide to e-commerce, which is by these guys, the Hammersley brothers, who've got a really cool podcast as well called ultimate guides to e-commerce. I think you can get their book for free online, the PDF copy, but these guys have been working with e-commerce brands since the beginning, helping to optimize them. And, you know, they start off with SEO and they moved into like, you know, fine tuning AdWords and they really break down what e-commerce is and the different elements of e-commerce and the different parts of the website and the different, you know, because people go, I want to increase my conversion rate. 
but there's a lot of there's a lot more that goes into that you know there's the add to basket rate and then there's how many people go from basket to checkout how many people go from checkout to placing an order how many people are actually coming onto the website what the bounce rate is all this kind of thing and they provide stats as to benchmarks you should use and they also go down and go through how to improve these certain um each of those different sections of the website and how to grow the business and how to increase average sale and what goes in, into the you know a product page what are the things people are looking for when they come to your product page and um they just go through everything to do with a website and how to finally tune it and improve your bottom line because you know if you can increase your average, if you can increase your average order slightly by having a, an upsell after people finish their order that can make a huge difference to your bottom line mm. Or if you can, you know, they talk about like um, if someone if someone comes to your product page and they want to purchase and you don't have any information there about how much shipping is or how long shipping takes or what your return policy is, they're probably going to leave. But that's such really easy to add to your page and make it make it put everything there the customer's looking for so that they can then check out. And so we have like a, an eight percent conversion rate for Forest Superfoods, which is huge in this industry. Most people are doing a what a one percent conversion rate. Yeah. But we've got the 8% conversion rate because I've spent God knows how many hours since we started just on that website and just making the website as informative as possible, but not just informative, but set out in a way that it, it answers the questions that customers have so that they have the information they need in order to make an informed decision about making a purchase or not. And so, yeah, the ultimate guide to e-commerce is something I really recommend for anyone who's got an e-commerce business. Uh, and then the other day, the other book that I wanted to talk about was a book that I read when I was probably 16 or something called Rich Dad, Poor Dad oh, yeah, by Robert too. Kiyosaki, yep. which just blew my mind. Like the idea of just, just that really simple, you could probably just look at the graph in there rather than read the book. But he's got this really amazing graph where you go, you can spend your income on expenses or you could spend your income on assets, which then provide a return, which pays your expenses. And that asset base grows over time, which therefore increases your net wealth. And so he talks about his rich dad who did that way and his poor dad who would just spend all of his income on expenses and never got ahead. And that book really blew my mind in terms of how to get real wealth. I, even, I saw something on YouTube the other day where someone was saying, you know, the way to get rich these days is to have as much debt as possible. And that works for a period until there's a downturn or until the interest rates get hiked up and then you're screwed. You know, that's not real wealth because you don't own anything. The banks own the thing. But real wealth is having ownership over assets that that provide a, 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 good quality, a good return over time. And so that's what I got out of the Rich Dad, Poor Dad book, which is a super easy read. And I think probably... um. Every kid should read it. Yeah, that, that book changed my life. And an uncle gave it to me when I graduated. And I, the, the front cover looks tacky. And you think it's just a, you know, it's a sales and marketing book. That, that's cheesy. But then it's actually really good. And that graph you're talking about, I, I showed it to my partner. And it, it just, it changed the way I looked at things. And, and yeah, the book about e-commerce, you can tell for anyone listening, um, that, that's exactly why I bought from, from, from Justin, because because of the way you now I know you've obviously put a lot of attention to the website. I, I do a lot of research before I buy anything, especially health related stuff. Yeah. And just after seeing your website or that landing page of, of, of the organic grades, it's like, I'm not going to buy anything else. This, this, this shit's good. So um, yeah. Kudos to you. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. Cause it's um, you've got two seconds to communicate to people that your site's trusted, that it's going to be a good shopping experience that, they're not you know that it's safe to purchase that it you know that the, the product is a good qu- there's so many things that you need to communicate to people and there's people who are at different stages of the buying situ- the buying process as well you know there's people who are just researching there's people who are ready to buy there are people who don't want any information they just want to know the price and how long delivery is going to be and then they want to purchase there are other people who want pages and pages and pages of reading material to learn more about the product and so it's about being able to kind of communicate to all those different people what it is they're looking for in order to have the confidence to make a purchase. And I think we're at the stage now, and this is really exciting, but I find it really exciting. A lot of people maybe don't, but, you know, the website is is finely chewed and the website's getting, you know, about 8% conversion. And now I'm just doing testing of that. So I look at like, 
Um, I'm doing tests through Google Optimize where you can just install like a tiny piece of code on your website and then you use Google Optimize to trial different things. So I'm trialing at the moment whether it says under the under the add to cart button free shipping when you spend 85 or it says three day free shipping when you spend 85 or it says plus free shipping when you spend 85. And so it will show 33% of customers each of those different variations. And then it will show you what the total revenue was for each of those different variations. And you can get an idea of what works best and what doesn't. So it's really exciting to test things. And the, the Hammersley brothers from the Ultimate Guides e-commerce, one of the things they say on their podcast is, what's the chances that the way you built and design and copyright the website the first time is the best way to do it? You know, and the chances are virtually zero that the mm. way you did it the first time is the best way it could possibly be. And I think that's why you do all this testing is because then you can, you can refine things and fine tune things to make them work the best way possible in order to communicate, you know, what you've got to customers really clearly and make that whole buying situation easier. And um, yeah, yeah. I've, there's a huge amount of work that's gone into that website. And we start off with Magento doing it running with Magento, which is like an e-commerce platform. That's yeah. so much work. And, you know, and I was just doing it myself, but every time I'd go to update a plugin, the whole thing would crash and it was just a nightmare. And, you know, e-commerce works good when you've got like um, different websites for every country and you've got, you know, 10 warehouses and you've got a whole team of developers. And, but I was just one guy you know, doing it by myself. And so it was so much work and it was, so unstable and unreliable and my wife for her she's got an organic business and she was using wordpress and she ha always had been from before i met her and she kept telling me how good wordpress was and i thought you know what i love magento but I'll just have a look at wordpress and i had a look and within three days i'd moved everything over because it was just so much more simple so much easier to use so much more stable in terms of doing updates and mm. um it just made sense i think shopify and wordpress are perfect for you know, for small businesses or small teams. But, um, you know, Magento was just so much work and I put so many hours into learning how to do it and how to code it and how to do the programming. And, you know, I think there was a big lesson in that in terms of shopping around and making sure that the website platform that you use is right for your circumstances. And because you're going to put a huge amount of hours and a huge amount of time, a huge amount of money into setting it up, maintaining it and keeping it running. And I also think that's why you've also got to think about using something like WooCommerce compared to one of the smaller ones, like, I don't know, BigCommerce or Wix or any of the other, you know, a lot of people get custom made website, pla website platform from a developer. But the problem is when that developer goes broke or when you want changes, you're at their mercy because no one else knows that system. And then if they're not updating it <laughs> for 12 months, if they don't update it, if they don't update their that that platform they built for you, then it starts to get you know there might be it starts to get flaws in it because it's not up to date with the security stuff. And so, I think the most important thing for people is to set up your website on a platform that has got mil hundreds of millions of other websites on it because you know it's a long term business and it's going to keep going. And make sure it's something which is secure and make sure it's something which is easy to update and maintain and it's going to be fast and you know really shop around and really think about what e-commerce platform you're you're going to use before you jump in because it's a big decision and you could and you could be stuck with it for a long time and i think you're always better off going with something like woocommerce or shopify where you know that it's going to be continually updated and it's going to be secure and fast and easy to use rather than going something which custom made and costs you you know, 10 grand or something. And you might have a lot of trouble keeping that up to date and, you know, getting changes made and, and, and installing new um, plugins onto that website as well. You know, the other day we, I was looking at um, adding a, 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 like a, an address order complete. So when you go to the ad, when you go to the order, the address, when you go to the checkout, you start typing your address and it comes up and suggests your actual address and it pre and it fills all the fields out for you. But that might be really hard to do on a custom on a custom platform. But if you're if you're with WooCommerce, there's hundreds of thousands of different plugins that you can add with one click and you can then expand the 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 offering you have in place on your website really easily without spending a fortune. And that's really important, you know, especially in this first couple of years when money can be really difficult.
Yeah, man. I, I think I think those, that's really good advice because I think a lot of people try and customize everything because they feel like they need to have that tiny little bit of change or something that doesn't really move the needle, but they feel like they want it. When actually sure. you have 99.99% of everything you need pretty much already yeah. right there in front of you. No, I agree. I agree and with the, you. And the customizing, it always ends up being a headache. You know, yeah. eventually it's going to be a headache. Eventually it's going to, conf- you're going to update, you're going to update the website and that custom work that was done, it doesn't fit with the core, with the core files anymore, you know? Yeah. And so, yeah, you're much better off just going with the stuff that's constantly updated. That's not custom built, but really close to what you want to do anyway. Yeah. There's almost yeah. always something available. Yeah, no, that's, that's what I did actually. So my business website, we custom built it. Uh, and then we basically just completely pulled back. It's now WordPress. We ripped out, we took away all the complicated templates as well. We just made it really simple, really easy to update very scalable so it's very useful. and that's and that's uh that's probably that might be another book but i read um steve about six years ago i re- read the steve jobs biography mm-hmm. and i love i i'd never before thought about this idea of like cutting things out as much as possible you know it's not about adding in as much as possible it's about it's about removing as much as possible so that you get to something which is a which is minimal and easy to understand and clear and benefits the customer completely. And cause he talks about, you know, how, I think it was, I think it was with why the, the uh, it was with the iPhone, you know, he was, he was comparing it with HTC and Samsung and everyone else was around the time that had all these features and he removed all of those features to just have the basic things available on the phone that people need to do. And it became the best selling phone ever. And he was always about minimal because less is more, you know? And that really blew my mind. And I really thought about, and that's what, you so that Naked Greens product you've got. Yeah. You know, I thought about what's the least we can put in this product to make it really, to give people real benefit. And then I, because I was looking at something like the Athletic Greens, which has got something like, what, 50 ingredients or something, yeah. something crazy like that. And if you're having a teaspoon, how much benefit are you getting from each of those 50 ingredients in one teaspoon? Mm. Very little, if any. Whereas if I could just put five products in as a, as a maximum and you have a teaspoon, well, there, you know, and there's 20% of each in there, you're getting real benefits from each of those. That's even exactly though it's just what a fifth I of a teaspoon. Them. Because it, uh, I like, I like, I'm really into health. So when I look at the back yeah. of products, I see what's in it. And there's a million, yeah. normally in like supermarket products, there's normally a million things that I have no idea what they are. But with, with this, um, with this, with this naked greens, it's just wheatgrass, barley grass, chlorella, moringa, and spirulina. And that's it. And that's, yeah. And that's, just, yeah. Just mixed, just mixed together. And that's because that yeah. was my thinking. My thinking was, why do you need all these ingredients? You know, there's something, mm-hmm. there's something in the brain that goes, oh, if there's more ingredients, I'm going to get more benefits. But logically, it doesn't make sense because you're having a teaspoon. Diluted. And so, uh, exactly. Mm-hmm. And these five, these, those five superfoods, as between them, they have such a, a broad spectrum of benefits that I think you're getting more benefit from having just those five than you are from having 50 different ingredients that don't necessarily need to be in there. You know, just, and, and because yeah. yeah. Speaking of health, and, and I'm mindful about our time. Um, if there is one supplement or superfood, you know, that's affordable, low pressure, that you th- if you think that someone can take every day, it would dramatically improve their lives. Is there something you'd recommend? It's a really hard decision because I, yeah. I don't sell it. I don't sell anything that I don't really like. Um, and we've got about 45 products now. I think if, if I talk about business people specifically, maybe if I talk about business people yeah. specifically, I would say the lion's mane for sure, because the lion's mane mushroom helps with concentration and memory in a way that I've never experienced from anything else. And it also gives that kind of energy boost. And it's like, you know, people will go, I'm, you know, I need to concentrate. So I'm going to have a coffee. But if you think about it, you have a coffee and it perks you up, but 20 minutes later, you're more tired than you were before you had the coffee. You know, it's coffee's actually, caffeine's really crap in terms of, giving us a, 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 a neurological benefit and even in terms of an energetic benefit, because it's it, it, that, that, that rush lasts is that rush is so short lived. And then there's this kind of crash that happens afterwards. Whereas you have something like lion's mane, 
it's this kind of increase in concentration and focus and energy that that lasts for hours and hours but there's you know you, i personally anyway don't see any crash that comes from that you know because it's just this food that it just reacts really well with the body and i even find if i take lion's mane for a couple of days in the row i'll be i'll be you know i'll be driving somewhere and i'll start singing these songs from my childhood that i haven't heard since i was six years old that actually come back because it 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 does something to the synapses in the brain where it 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 strengthens them and i remember things from my childhood and i remember things from ages ago that i forgot about but then it also gives that concentration benefit and i think when you're in business you know the focus and the concentration and that idea of getting in the zone is really important and i think part of the reason why i got you know i was able to to build the business and get it get it up and running really quickly was because of that concentration and that getting in the zone that a lot of sports people talk about when they're you know and you've experienced that as well you know i'm a swimmer so like sometimes you swim and you just forget you're swimming because you're in that zone and you're just in the moment and you're not you're not tired and you're not exhausted you're just you're just going through the motions of it and your body gets in the cycle and the rhythm of it and i think lion's mane really um helps to encourage that getting in the zone mentally um but then you know there's other products i love as well like for people that suffer from anxiety or stress i think ashwagandha root's incredible for anxiety absolutely incredible the the benefits it has for anxiety and stress and depression and i think if you've got issues with you know libido or people with or women going through menopause maca is incredible you know for that kind of stuff uh, maca root for reducing hot flushes and for bouncing hormones and for increasing libido and then i think bee pollen is amazing for energy so for slow release energy throughout the day i have a tea you know two teaspoons of bee pollen a, a muesli in the morning and i'm going all day just from that and it's so nutritionally complete that they talk about um bee pollen being one of the few things on the planet that's a complete food so you could pretty much live off just bee pollen i would have recommended yes. it but it's so nutritionally complete that you could pretty much just live off that and so you think about you know all that goodness that's going into your body and um yeah i don't know i love i love all the products but i guess there's specific products which are great for specific things and we're actually i'm at the moment work doing a um a booklet that's going to go out with every order which is just going to have my top 10 products and what i like about each one and if people email me through the website or support at forest or oh, justin at forestsuperfoods.com.au i'll send them a free copy of that booklet as well so they can get some ideas of you know what might work best for them and for the lawyers out there lion's mane is cheaper than cocaine so <laughs> in most countries <laughs> yeah <laughs> For the time being, anyway, we'll see with all these uh, all these increased freight costs and all the increased labor costs and raw materials, and we'll, we'll see. You know. Maybe not for long. And the um, yeah, drug see prices are going down. That's all I'm saying. Drug prices are going down. So you don't know, right? <laughs> exactly. All right, uh, Justin. Hey, thanks so much for your time. Um, I think uh, we always like to give our guests as well. Like, if in, is there anything you want to talk about? Anything you want to shout out? Share, promote. I mean, now's your time um yeah i think um if people if they're interested in learning more they can go to our forest superfoods community group which is on facebook so you've got i think there's 2000 people so far in the group and everybody talks about you know people ask questions about i've got this issue what product you know worked well for you and they ask advice from each other and people will share recipes and we put say special offers and things on there so I encourage people if they're really keen on superfoods and improving their health to join the uh, Forest Superfoods community group. And then uh, we've always got new products coming out. So we've got Australian Spirulina, which is freeze dry, which is coming out next month, which I'm really excited about because I don't know of anyone who's doing Australian Spirulina. Um, and we've got um, we've just got a new blend that's come out called the Inflammation Blend, which is all based on Ayurvedic plants. So it's got moringa turmeric amla and um and pepper and that's re that three three amazing plants that are incredible for um reducing inflammation in the body so that's a new product that people should go check out on the website and um yeah we're always you know we're we're really 
focus on helping people. So if you have any questions, email us at justin at forestsuperfoods.com.au or support at forestsuperfoods.com.au and um, we'll help you out however we can. Awesome. We'll put all these links in the show notes in, on our website. So when this podcast comes out, Justin, you'll see everything. Uh, we'll put everything there. You okay with us sharing your email as well? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, yeah. cool. We'll put, we'll put your uh, email there as well. And then you can ask Justin for money and stuff like that. That's completely fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, don't ask him for money. He doesn't have to ask. <laughs> uh, you're going to get an email from us very soon, Justin. Don't worry. <laughs> um, Dave, you want, you want to take us out, man? Yeah. So Justin, once again, that was a really, um, that was a really insightful, insightful conversation. So thanks for that. I think our, our viewers and listeners will learn a lot and thanks so much for your time. So everyone, please uh, don't forget to follow, like, subscribe, comment, and whatever on all our platforms. So we're in, we're in everything. So just look us up, Business Over Drinks. Um, and, and for the show notes and for the book recommendations of Justin, check out businessoverdrinks.com and go to the show notes section. So thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. It's been lots of fun. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, we hope you enjoyed this podcast. And once again, just a very quick message for all of you guys is that the world is ending, zombies are coming, the vaccine is actually a zombie virus and we're all going to die. But anyway, in all seriousness though, we'd like to talk about a sponsor, Liquor Loot. So Liquor Loot is an amazing company, so we're really happy to have them on board. They house alcohol subscription services, Whiskey Loot and Gin Loot. And they deliver three premium and hand-selected whiskey and gin tasters from around the world each month. All right. Thanks, Dave. Your, your energy is infectious. That, <laughs> that was sarcasm, man. You, you sounded like you were dead. Right. So, <laughs> um, so like zombie we virus, wouldn't, we, wouldn't be a, we wouldn't be a podcast with our listeners and we wouldn't have sponsors with our listeners. So our listeners get a special offer on whiskey at from Whiskey Loot. So just head over to our website businessoverdrinks.com and head over to our sponsorship page or even our show notes page where we'll actually put a link to liquor loot just click on that link and then check it out you'll be able to get a you'll be able to chance to get a, a taste of a curated selection of hard fine scotches single malts and new world whiskies including japanese and american ones i actually they're all award-winning most of them are award-winning actually so it's kind of cool uh, i prefer the japanese ones personally because i think they do better whiskey than the americans so here we go uh, head over to businessoverdrinks.com, click on our sponsorship section and look out for Likalu. And remember everyone, drink responsibly, don't be like Tung, and do not sue us at whatsoever. Yeah, please don't sue us. Be responsible.